Hello, everyone. Welcome to From the Hangar podcast. I'm your host, Lem Malabuyo. You may notice if you're watching this that we are in a very completely different setting. This is, does not look like a hangar at all. So one of the things that happens around here is a lot of training and a lot of seminars. So right now, what's happening is something called IPS or mm -hmm. Instructor Pilot Seminars. And they invited a bunch of the pilots from MAF as well as like national staff. Is that correct? National staff come too for that? Do you guys know? Some of them do, so, yes. Okay. Um, to do these things, but it's kind of more or less all hands on deck in the <laughs> hangar. So it didn't seem didn't seem very polite to ask if we can do a set of from the hangar podcast <laughs> while all that was happening. So we are here in my AV office doing this, and uh, it's been it's been fun. It's actually been kind of a fun challenge to see how I can make this work <laughs> in this in this room because I haven't done something like this where we had four different people on a on the screen. So hopefully this is appealing to the eyes as much as seeing airplanes parked behind you. So our apologies. But one of the really cool things about came out that came out of the IPS or uh, in, instructor pilot seminar. I'm, mm -hmm. I've been told to not use a lot of abbreviations in this because yeah. a lot of people don't know it. So now yeah. I'm trying to avoid that, which will be difficult considering the kind of conversations we're going to have in a moment here. But anyway, um, one of the benefits is that one of the people that came in from overseas is this gentleman over <laughs> here across the table from me. His name is Tyler Schmidt. Um, and people here in the middle are his parents, mm -hmm. Fred and Desi Schmidt. And one of the neat things about I guess mission work, um, it's not necessarily unique to you guys, mm. um, but it is a really cool story. And that's the aspect of like multi-generational um, mission work um, in families. And so, I mean, they can, they can, they're going to tell their stories and everything, but, you know, Fred was a missionary kid himself, mm -hmm. you know, grew up overseas. Tyler being a son of this family who, you know, they've been, they've been MAF missionaries for Many many years, and Tyler grew up overseas as a missionary kid. So, we we have we we are seeing here um, like three generations, or I guess we're seeing two, two generations, but mm -hmm. it's three generations at least I know of of this family being missionaries. And so I thought that was a really cool thing and something that I would love to kind of dig into. So let's let's get you guys to introduce yourselves. Enough talking, enough talking from me about telling your story. You guys can tell your stories. How, Fred and Desi, can you guys um, introduce yourselves? Tell, tell us about yourselves and um, your time with MAF, what your roles have been, where you've served, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I'm Desi Schmidt, and uh, we've been with MAF almost 40 years. Wow. Yeah. And we um, actually, we were slated or we wanted to go to Latin America was our first thought that we would go overseas with Latin mm. America. And um, God's providence, he changed us to Africa. So <laughs> we've <laughs> served in uh, Zimbabwe and Botswana. And um, we've been at the U.S. headquarters in Redlands. Um, we also went overseas to Ecuador, and we spent about 14 years there. And our last stint was actually in in Indonesia in Kalimantan okay. for almost well, almost three years. Yeah. Wow. So, but Fred and I met in uh, at Grace University in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, he was on his way to missions, and my heart was also geared towards that. And um, we had only been married, I think, about four years when we got onto the mission field. Oh wow! Yeah. Well, the that sounds pretty quick, mm -hmm. actually. Was that pretty normal back back in the day when you guys were looking into mission work, or? Uh, no, actually not. Uh, typically, back in those days, it took quite a few years for people to raise their support. Yeah. And MAF, when we joined, had instituted what they called uh, fast track, and um, they it was about three years old or so. And it was looking at raising your support in six months, which was kind of a new, that was almost scandalous, you know, because it was, <laughs> it was way too fast. I mean, you can't do that. Wow. And, and yet that was our experience. Mm. And, uh, and, and it, it was all training of how, first of all, what is the biblical stance for for raising funds for for mission work and then 
um, once you understood that, then making your presentation and tweaking it. So we did videos, just like what we're doing now, standing up in front of a bunch of people <laughs> in a church and then critiquing it afterwards. But really helped yeah. to uh, gain confidence yeah. and then go out. Very cool. So, well, let me rewind a little bit for you guys. Um, like, Fred, like, mission aviation itself, like, how did you get interested in something like that? My folks were missionaries uh, in Ecuador, um, in Shell, at the time that the five missionaries were killed. Mm. Um, my mom and dad were both teaching at a little Bible institute there, not related to MAF at all. And um, they, along with almost all of the mission community, were shocked when they heard of the death of the five because uh, it had been kept very secret. And Mm -hmm. there's reasons for it that are explained in a number of the books. But uh, my folks were involved with the uh, memorial service Mm -hmm. for them that was held there in Shell itself. And so that was before... I was alive, so I was born a year and a half later. Okay, in Ecuador. In uh, no, I was the only one of my siblings that was not <laughs> born in Ecuador. We were on furlough. Oh, okay. At the okay. time, but um, and I grew up there. Uh, went to a grade school in the new Nate Saint Memorial School that was uh, developed in my basically my second grade year, and. Um, and then went to uh, boarding school in Quito at the uh, Christian and Missionary Alliance uh, high school, grade school, high school there. So I graduated from high school and then uh, uh, went to Grace University, which is mm-hmm. where yeah. Desi and I met. Yeah. But had, like, did you hear about that Nate Saint story? And, and Oh, yeah. yeah Growing that, up that and was, everything. Was that what inspired you to go into no, aviation? No, not or? so much that as we lived right next to the airstrip. And airplanes were taking off okay. every yeah. day, and that was just happened to be a very high interest area. Okay. And I would run out and look at the planes, or stick my head out the window of the house, or <laughs> just to to watch it go by. And uh, my mom's comment was, "Fred, you're going to be the missionary pilot, and you're going to fly your brother Merv, who was interested in learning one of the the languages, mm. uh, the oh, jungle okay. languages, <laughs> and." Uh, and that just stuck with me yeah. um, until the beginning of college. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Well, so I don't, so Tyler doesn't have to sit here and not say anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put you on the spot now. Like, yeah, introduce yourself and kind of tell us about, um, yeah, how you came to MAF and what your role is now. Yeah. I'm Tyler Frederick Schmidt. So yes, <laughs> I'm still named after my dad. Um Interested in aviation from day one because I see my dad do it all the time. Top Gun back in the day (laughs) was a big, oh, my brother is going to be the backseater and I'm going to be the pilot. And, you know, as you grow up, you kind of figure out, hey, you know, it's not like the movies. (laughs) And I was like, is there another way to get into aviation that is meaningful as well? And so mission work combining the the relationship I had with Christ as well as the skill set and interest of aviation as a tool um, became more and more apparent, especially in middle school. I was like, yeah, I want to be a missionary pilot. And I had a front row seat yeah. to be able to observe that <laughs> and had gone out on a lot of flights in uh, Botswana. Um, those are the ones I especially remembered. Mm. Um, going out and seeing the people landing on salt pans and seeing donkeys and being really hot and then uh, seeing the people too that come back wow. and hanging out at the hangar <laughs> and uh, seeing you repair the aircraft there. So lots of things that kind of, they didn't have to push me that way, but I was very interested to begin with. Yeah. And that's where I, I got the bug yeah. of aviation. Very cool. And are you, did you guys have more than one kid or is Tyler your only son? We have four children. Tyler's oh. the oldest. Oh, okay. Yeah. How, did any of the other ones go into aviation as well or is Tyler the no. oddball out here? No. I'm the oddball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's the only one. Yeah. How about your? How about um, yourself, Fred? Like, did your any of your siblings go into aviation, or yeah. did, did other aspects of mission work? Yeah. Um, I have four siblings: one sister and uh, three brothers. 
uh, my two younger brothers, I'm the middle child, so two younger and two older. My two younger brothers uh, both got into aviation. One, um, uh, and they both went to Moody Bible Institute's uh, aviation mm-hmm. training school, Moody Aviation. And so one joined SAM Air, South American Missions Air, okay. in Peru, and were there for 20 years. And they are now uh, with Moody Aviation and training, okay. busy training. And he's still flying Wow! after all these That's years. Cool. But uh, cool. And then my youngest brother, uh, he went with Sam Air, he and his wife, for about two years. And we're going to go back. And then the Lord redirected them into getting involved with this new company that was called Quest Aircraft oh. Company. And he is still with that company, but it's now called the Kodiak yeah. uh, Aircraft Very Company. Very cool. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. man. I love it. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm, I kind of want to, like, ask some some fun questions a little bit. So one of the things that, at least in my experience, so I, I also grew up as a missionary kid in the Philippines, but, like, as a 12-year-old kid, like, that's when we became missionaries. So part of my life was in the United States, and then, anyway... But one of the things I've noticed coming back from the mission field and going into the States and going to college is that missionary kids are, they, they are a unique bunch of, of people. <laughs> so I, I kind of want to ask Desi, you know, like meeting Fred, like, was that, was that something that you observed? Like, was, was, was Fred a unique type of, type of person that you, you met? Um, and yes. did that, did like him being in the mission field kind of play into that a little bit or? Yeah, it did. <laughs> A little bit, although I was intrigued by um, his life, and missions always had intrigued me, and so I was asking questions, a lot of questions about what it was like growing up, but, you know, like learning about the latest jokes or the latest, (laughs) oh, advertisements on TV, it was just kind of like, I don't know that person, <laughs> or I don't know anything about that. So that was a unique thing. It's just like, you don't know about that part of the culture? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 I, I heard that a lot. Mm-hmm. So. Or actors, yeah. or yeah. musicians, it's like... Yeah, or anything like that, yep. yeah. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. How about yourself, Tyler? Like, did you, like, you, you actually, you know, talk, talk about your family a little bit. I guess I probably should ask you about that. Like, so... I'm just a carbon copy here. So I actually <laughs> went I actually went to Grace University as well many years later and uh, was coming in, you know, fresh from Ecuador uh, 2002 after graduating. And it was a very unique experience. Yeah, there was the same exact, it didn't change. It was like jokes, <laughs> The Simpsons, and I didn't get The Simpsons. Why is that such a cool show? <laughs> It's like, ah, I'm going outside. It's <laughs> far more intriguing. And uh, I hooked up with uh, other MKs, uh, missionary kids, TCKs, or yeah. third culture kids. And that's how I was able to kind of have a safe spot mm-hmm. for me to come back after going out into a very foreign country and not growing up in the American culture so much. And uh, allowed me to tr- somewhat transition into the ability to understand how do people think, what are some of their motives, um, how do I temper some of my enthusiasm about certain things that have no importance to, on, on their radar. Um, so yeah, it's like, how do I talk to these people to be, to connect with them and have find common ground versus mm. talking about these huge mountains or these gross bugs or this amazing dish that is made out of your pets and I'm really sorry, but it was delicious. So, oh man, guinea pig. Oh, man. And yeah, so stuff like that. So it was, it's a, I think culture is an amazing thing that is different depending on where you're, you're at. And especially coming, you may have a passport, but it's not your culture. Mm. And so that's hence the third where you're not part of your passport and you're not part of your, your ministry culture as well. You're kind of in between and you can kind of flit in and out between those two mm-hmm. cultures, but still be very different. Either you look different or you just think different. Yeah. And so uh-huh. that's a little bit of how we're doing. And unfortunately, I'm doing that to my family right now. <laughs> I met my wife uh, in college as well. North Dakotan girl as well. 
Same as my mother. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I have four kids. Um, and yeah, right now they're turning 15, 13, 12, and 7. So they're getting, yeah. getting older. I'm getting smaller for some reason. Stop feeding them. That might help. Uh, but they are, yeah, TCKs. They've been yeah. in Indonesia for uh, almost their entire lives, especially our youngest who was born overseas. And so, yeah, they, they're coming back to the States and they're trying to reconnect with their cousins. And sometimes it works. And as they get older, it's harder yeah. to reconnect just because mm -hmm. of that cultural difference yep. and priorities, yeah. especially. So, but they definitely connect with the under all the the other third culture kids because, oh, hey, you're playing, I'm playing, we must be friends. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so playgrounds and common interests are just like, I don't care what you look like. Can you throw a ball or do you like to talk to me? Where are you from? That's great. Yeah. I want to ask more questions um, and learning. So, yeah, that's part of the, the TCK experience. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That's great. Thanks. I, uh, I wanted to ask you guys, you know, raising just raising a family overseas in, in a in missions context you know like how how was that how was that for you i'll ask fred and desi that question first you know like <laughs> raising a family and and doing that and you guys did it, it seems like it sounds like you guys did it in multiple countries right mm -hmm. like you moved from is it botswana and zimbabwe Ecuador, botswana and then, and then ecuador. ecuador and like you had your kids with you for all three of those stints yes. as mm -hmm. well i mean like yeah how was that yeah. like where were some joys and, and, and challenges that maybe you guys faced during that time? I think, to tell you the truth, we went over when Ty was just two. And yeah. so raising children in the stateside culture was foreign to us. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so when you ask that question, it's just like, we raised him like we thought we should, you know. Yeah. Um, Maybe some differences were that we really tried to do stateside um, holidays and to bring some of that, what we knew about holidays from the states to us in our own home, in our, um, in our home, you know, we would do Christmas trees mm -hmm. and we would um, try to do some Easter celebrations and, and try to make that a norm. Um, as far as raising kids, you know, we we relied heavily on books and, yeah. um, you know, James, James Dobson and all those type of um, authors that were really important for us. So, yeah. I, you know, it's I think at one point we were we came home for about two and a half years to the States and were had our children in a, a school environment, Christian school environment. And that was probably the hardest time that we had raising our kids mm. because we were struggling with the culture. And we were struggling with, you know, how do our kids have friends with others and they think differently than their friends do. Or uh, So there's definitely challenges, but we couldn't wait to get back overseas just um, we felt more comfortable there, yeah. I guess. Mm -hmm. And in raising our kids, we had more say in how to raise our children, I think. Yeah. The impact of the U.S. culture was less when we were overseas because there were some things that we didn't appreciate. Mm. Some emphasis that uh, were coming out more and more. And so that was, it was a relief, really, <laughs> to go back overseas. Mm. Okay. And then we moved into a, a base situation where the uh, the school was about 30 second run from our house. <laughs> and so um, it was just a rock throw away, basically. Wow. Oh. That was fun. How about yourself, Tyler? What, what's it been like for you and Renee to to raise a family in, in the overseas context? Yeah, it's been different. For sure. It, but my context versus her context. No, yeah. Two different conversations <laughs> there. To me, it's like, oh, yeah, that's normal. That's normal. And she's like, no, that's no, that's no, that's not normal. Well, well, honey, what is normal? <laughs> well, the majority. <laughs> so right now it's normal. <laughs> so we're overseas and this is the majority of how you do that. And yeah, it's been it has been a struggle with just uh, being in a base that's smaller 
So there's not that many friends and being in a culture where they kind of put you on a pedestal mm. and kind of treat you as a, a, a movie star or a celebrity of some sort. But then that, that has its negative connotations as well because mm-hmm. it's not really mm. looking for a relationship with you. It's just I just want the social, social status. Sure. So that's kind of hard where you're like, are they really <laughs> wanting to be friends or are they just wanting to come over and play with our toys or our kids' toys? And, that, and that's sometimes that leaves a bad taste. And so we're always trying to guard, guard that and guard them. And now mm-hmm. that we have moved to a different program um, mm-hmm. for our kids' schooling needs, that has also changed a lot. There is a much mm-hmm. bigger expat uh, community there that allows them to actually kind of choose more and more friends and have a choice of more activities as well versus yeah. a very small school setting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. It's so much fun to hear you guys talk. It's just <laughs> like, I feel like I'm, I'm with my people right now. <laughs> <laughs> <There you are. laughs> yeah. But I mean like that, that idea, like I think, you know, one of the, one of the terminologies or, or words or phrases that um, maybe missionary kids or mission communities use is like, your passport country like what's your mm-hmm. passport country right um and so like hearing like you two talk about how for your kids like going back to their passport country was was a bit of a challenge to it's essentially a foreign country to them yeah. but that's their mm-hmm. passport country right and so um yeah i think that just it's it's so complex and there's mm-hmm. so much uh just so much depth to all of it that yeah. i think it, it's something to to know mm-hmm. and to also appreciate because I think there is something incredible about living overseas and, mm-hmm. and seeing your parents do this work for people um, that's meaningful and they want to see them know Jesus. And yeah, I kind of grew up in that. And like, and you know, I'm like, I see it with Tyler, you know, he wants, he wanted to be an aviation pilot or just a pilot, I guess. Is there such a thing of non-aviation pilot? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, a boat you know, pilot? Like, that's just, it's just really neat to see, that kind of influence because I think that in, in my own life I remember seeing knowing my father at the age of 42 years old deciding hey I want to do a career shift mm-hmm. from mechanical engineering to going into mission work you know like what do you guys think about this and of course like me knowing only the states you know it's like well we're gonna like move away from our friends and you know like, yeah. push back a little bit mm-hmm. you know as a sixth grader but going back and looking back on that time, yeah, I just have this deep appreciation for that. And it really did shape the way I made decisions and mm-hmm. like the career choices I made and how I wanted to navigate that through through the word and all that stuff. So I think mm-hmm. it's just it's just really neat. So yeah. Um okay. I'm trying to think of a I don't want to do any hard hitting questions or anything like that. <laughs> but um one of the things I was really interested in is to ask like Tyler, you know, you growing up as a, as an MK, um, did you take any of that, you know, what your parents, you know, raised you up and taught you overseas? Did you take that into your own, into your own parenting style or the things that you've learned, um, raising your own kids and and also being a husband? That's a really good question. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I think, you know, (laughs) when you are, being a child versus the adult, there's a, there's a tremendous difference between the two. And then go, being a parent, you're like, well, what do I know? Well, I know what I observed from my parents. And so you kind of start doing the same things. You're like, well, well why is this? And as you start to dig f- deeper, you're like, oh, because that was based on the b- <laughs> biblical truth of why they did that. And like, that's a great way to do that. Why Why would I want to do something different. And so observing them and also adding and studying myself from books and podcasts and Mm -hmm. talking with other parents around and and that were like-minded as well as struggling in their own ways. You're like, Hey, how can we share information or tips on how to help each unique child in their own, their own path? Yeah. And so, yeah, that's seeing how they raised me and then, then you have my wife, who's the balancing factor of that. She's seen a different way, but being able to balance those two different uh, perspectives mm. into one that, yes, we agree to do this with our kids, either whether it's discipline, whether it's encouragement, whether 
yeah, we're not going to allow that into our home. Mm -hmm. Those types of, of decisions that help with the parenting process. And it's, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's difficult because you're working with your own cultural shock and the child is like, I don't know any different. (laughs) This is (laughs) normal to me. (laughs) So especially when they come home for furlough and they see something radically, radically different than what they had been observing when they're in quote unquote home. Mm. Yeah. And and I, I imagine, you know, your kids growing up as, as MKs or TCKs or, you know, Yes, and yes. whether whether what whatever abbreviation we should go with, but um, see, I'm not, I'm already going against everything I was told not to do. And you can put it in subtitle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, they grew they grew up in the like their experience is just so it's so different today than it was when you were growing up. And I mm-hmm. imagine you know when Fred when you were growing up overseas mm-hmm. as, as an MK too. You know, um, just hearing like I think even going overseas with MAF and just seeing like. I guess like the technology that they, they have at their fingertips too. I'm like, Oh man, you guys have all this stuff. Like, man, I didn't have, I didn't have any of this. <laughs> it's like, this is so cool. Yeah. Like, but maybe that's just me being an old curmudgeon saying, you don't, you don't know, you don't realize how good you have it kind of thing. But anyway, I, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't even know where I was going with that. Uh, but I did. So I kind of want to shift gears a little bit um, because you guys, you guys went to Indonesia um, mm-hmm. in the in in more 20, recent years. Yeah. The end of 20. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you guys went to the Kalimantan mm-hmm. program. Mm-hmm. And lo and behold, the director of the <clears throat> Kalimantan program was your son, Tyler. So that's like, I just thought that was just a great, like, I got to ask this question, you know, like, <laughs> how was that? How was that interaction that like that father son relationship? And then also like, you know, I guess, employee boss relationship but it's you know the son's the the director and you're the mechanic and yeah just like how how is that like did you guys have to have a conversation leading into this that was like okay we gotta figure this out or what was that like no (laughs) i i there was there for me there was no conflict of of uh who we were and what our responsibilities were i um, I had no problems with him being my boss mm. and, um, and I didn't have any problems with giving him counsel if there was mm. something needed. And we would, we would, um, well, once a week go out to, to lunch together and just, just talk. And that was really somewhat of a continuation of what we did when we were growing up too. So, um, I, I don't know, was there a conflict there for you? (laughs) Not for me. (laughs) (laughs) Might've been for other people, but it was, it was only a lack of information and what they filled into that blank space that really I had to start explaining Mm. some of that, but it was a really trying time. So having somebody that was not necessarily involved in the conflict, but could impart wisdom was very very, very helpful. And so I could release just enough details to like, hey, here's the general situation and this is what I'm feeling. I'm assuming this is what they're feeling right now. How do I move godly forward in a way that actually helps all of us? Where's my blind spot? What am I doing wrong so that I can clear that out so that I can help the other person Mm. is a lot of what our conversations were about. Um, really focusing around what is God doing in this situation versus what do I have to do to build my kingdom and my legacy as programmed? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was a time uh, with COVID and with a lot of team dynamics that it was really nice to have my dad and my mom around just for that extra support emotionally and spiritually yeah. as well. So. It was, for me, it was amazing. And there was not a conflict of power or authority or father head figure at all. Okay. Well, that's, that's just very mature, the two of you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's really cool, too. I think one of the neat aspects is, too, is that your kids got to grow up a little bit, spend time with their grandparents. Oh. Like, mm-hmm. how awesome is that? Like, that was fantastic. Yeah. 
It really was the cherry on top of the cupcake, so yeah. to speak. It really, to spend time with our grandkids and do holidays together yeah. for not just one season, but for a little extended time. And not only that, we got to love on some other fantastic TCKs, third yeah. culture kids. Uh-huh. And so I, it was a definite privilege to be mm. going there. Mm-hmm. To be surrogate grandparents. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's cool. I love it how short term it was, you know, you go there for one year. And so, yeah, 36 months later, they left. (laughs) (laughs) Tyler, you said they would only be here for a year. (laughs) I said nothing (laughs) and promised nothing. (laughs) Oh, man, that's great. Okay, so uh, you guys kind of spoke a little bit into it um, earlier in the episode, but there has been some like shifts and kind of like roles and like moving mm-hmm. to different departments and stuff. So like Tyler, like tell me you, you were in Kalimantan or Tar- in Tarakan, which is like, if, if you guys don't want to look at a map, like Indonesia, there's like a, a, a West mm-hmm. Island of Kalimantan and Tarakan is the big city there. That's where MF is based. Um, but there is Papua, mm-hmm. which is on the Eastern side of the country. And there's also a, a large central base of, of, for MAF there as well as Santani. But Tyler, you want to like, talk about like that shift that you were speaking about, how you did that um, so that your kids can go to school there. And, and yeah, just talk to talk to us about that decision. And, it was and, an agonizing so. one year ordeal of talking and praying and trying to figure out, you know, if we leave, we are leaving a huge hole here in this program with no outside help per se. There was nobody in the shoot to replace me Mm. or the experience. And so that was me dragging my feet of like, I don't know. But as Renee, who's, you know, the mother and is my wife and is seeing the other side of things like, I don't, our (laughs) kids are needing something a little bit more. Um, And it, it was really funny that once I, warmed up to the idea and felt like this was, you know, the, the next pathway that we're going to do. She started to drag her feet. It's like, no, maybe we shouldn't go because <laughs> enlisting all these reasons. And I'm like, that's not how it works, honey. You can't just be the drag shoot now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, a lot of one year knowing that the ministry is not my ministry. It's God's ministry. Mm. He will continue and give strength to the people that are left behind. That was really hard to come to grips. I'm still coming Mm -hmm. to grips with not trying to blame myself for the things that have happened since we've left. But to say, you know what, that's, there is growth in pain Mm -hmm. and there's growth that the team is happening right now and has solidified those teammates together because of the hardships. And I don't think it would happen if I was still there. And it has been a hard transition to move from Kalimantan to the dark side. (laughs) Papua, no, they're not the dark side. But um, a bigger program, a lot more families, a lot more like this is how we need to keep going and moving with a schedule versus flowing with what are the needs of the people Mm. of the area. Mm. So I um, am no longer in charge of operations or the program or of personnel, which has been very freeing for me. I do not feel the level of stress that I used to feel. And I can Mm. actually concentrate on my family and on my teenage boys and uh, my daughters right now to bring them back up to a healthier level of of life where it was lacking because of just the demands of the ministry and the program and the lack of boundaries on my own part Mm. too in Kalimantan. So school, there's a high school there. There is band. There is uh, ballet classes. There are sports. That like you could be busy every single night with an activity, uh, unlike Tarakan. And it's now figuring out okay, what do we hold back on so that we can still have family time yeah. in Santani? Yeah. So I recently transitioned from the Kodiak into a caravan. It's a great tool. It's different and it does a job. I still miss the Kodiak. But it is still um, something that I'm very happy to serve. Yeah, uh, the people in Papua. It's 
it's like a different country, a different <laughs> world all yeah. the way. It's like uh-huh. steep mountains that are up to 14, 15,000 feet, uh, different airstrips that are just plastered onto whatever uh, <laughs> level area. It's still 10 to 15 percent up. So it's a hike to get back up to the airstrip if you uh, stop at the bottom. And uh, the people there uh, mm-hmm. that remind me very much of when my time in Botswana was mm-hmm. like. So the African mm-hmm. culture, yeah, there are very similar and, and parallels to that yeah. too. So that's that's a difference between the two programs and the transition that my family is current, yeah. currently going through. Yeah. Well, what I appreciate about the, just that you talking <laughs> about that was, um, like you you were just you and your wife Renee are just very mindful of the well being of your children, right? And I think that's. That's that's really key. And I think that's you know every family has to ask those questions whether you're overseas in Indonesia or you're here in the states, mm-hmm. you know, thinking about your your kids' well being. Um, and so yeah, that's just really really neat. So very and cool. MAF is is mindful of that too. How do we keep missionaries? How do we keep them to be have longevity over there and giving resources to it, allowing us to be able to do that? Yeah, and that. That is tremendous. There are other missions that don't have that depth. We'll put those in the show notes for you guys. Okay. Those other missions. <laughs> Join <laughs> MAF. Join MAF, guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, you guys, so you have since um, shifted back to HQ mm-hmm. from Indonesia, um, much to... Tyler and Renee's relief. They told me. They told me that. Oh, did they? Yeah. <laughs> I'm still waiting for the check. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, what what are you guys? Um, what's your role at MAF now? Being based back here in HQ. We I've moved into a relatively new uh, department of MAF mm-hmm. called Waypoints, and he said we were trying to figure out how do you what's. Ten words that describes waypoints, <laughs> and uh, we kept flip flopping around. But I would say it is um, it is where we are like mentors mm-hmm. to come alongside young people to help make them successful in cross cultural ministry, mm-hmm. and um, so that involves. Um, workshops in different uh, different aviation training schools. It involves mentoring one-on-one, and typically that means via uh, like the Zoom screen. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. They, um, a couple months ago, we did an episode on the pre-fielders, and they, they were talking about waypoints and, like, yeah. how awesome, it was, how great it's been to have that department um, created and something that, you know, has been they can tap into essentially mm-hmm. um, because yeah, it's been a way for them to guide, guide them into mission work um, in a healthy, uh, in a healthy way so that, you know, like you can, you can have as much training and expectation as you can as possible. Um, and then you go overseas and it just helps mitigate some of those, mm-hmm. some of those surprises that that may come your way. And so, yeah, it was just, I was just really, it was just really cool. And then like you guys, just recently came back from Ecuador, right? For an internship. Yeah. We just got back. Yeah. We've only been back like two and a half weeks. Yeah. How, so. so how was that? How was that internship with, with you guys? Well, I think, um, someone described it as we were all sufficiently, sufficiently, um, stressed <laughs> <laughs> in a good way. I mean, uh, what we experienced there brought up conversations about culture it brought up, um, we had some health scares. Um, we were able to get into Ecuadorians' homes and, and um, you know, not knowing the language, you felt the tension of that. And you want interns to, to feel that mm-hmm. because it introduces the idea that language is important when you go overseas. And um, it was an a wonderful microcosm look of what life living overseas is like. And so it was, it was successful yeah. in that, in that way. Very cool. That's awesome. And you still, in, are you guys still in touch with the, the interns? Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and we, we met with them like six times before, no, not six, but five times in the weeks 
preceding our going to Ecuador to be in, in preparatory. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then during the time we met as well, and we were following a, a kind of a book that just really is helpful in pinpointing key issues in our lives that uh, need to be focused on that can be uh, stumbling blocks if we don't focus on them when we get overseas. So we had some very uh, awesome conversations very cool. talking of God's truth and, and how, how it's so important to make that a part of your life. Otherwise, there's going to be difficulties. Yeah. And it's, it's, this is so great to hear you guys talking about too, because it's just, it's, it's like bringing your wisdom like of years and decades of experience into people who don't necessarily have that experience yet. And they're looking for, for wisdom from others. And I think this is like, I think the waypoints department is such a, I thought that was such a brilliant move by MAF. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. So, and I think that's just one of the cool things too about, about mission work as a whole, I think as, as Christians do this more and more decades after decades, learning, realizing, mm-hmm. oh, you know what? Maybe this should be something we should do. Cause like, yeah, we're like, people are struggling overseas because like, they don't, they weren't prepared in, in this aspect or in this aspect. It's like, well, we can speak into that. Let's, let's do it. So mm-hmm. I think it's just really cool. So, but it also plays into the narrative of the multi-generational thing that I want to do with this episode. So perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, everyone, thanks for, for joining us. Um, and if you like this episode, make sure you hit the subscribe button or like this episode. Um, share your thoughts in the comments or you can email us at podcast at maf.org. Um, Tyler, Fred, Desi, thanks for for <laughs> sitting here and just talking and laughing with me a little bit here about mission missionary families. It's been great. Thanks for Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, it's been fun to hang out here with you. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, that's good. All right. We'll see you guys next time. Bye.